Hi everyone, I'm Luke Vagley, Outreach and Membership Manager here at Clean Wisconsin. Thank you for attending our biannual Doug LaFollette Environmental Speakers Program. We are fortunate to have three youth climate activists here with us today to discuss their experiences advocating for climate action at the local level and inspiring others to join the cause. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the role that the 12 First Nations of what is now referred to as Wisconsin play as past and present caretakers of this land. If you are listening to this panel from Madison or Milwaukee, this is the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi nations respectively. If you are watching from another part of Wisconsin, this too is the ancestral home of one of the 12 First Nations. Despite decades of government-led attempts at removal, the First Nations remain prominent and dedicated caretakers of the land. Here at Clean Wisconsin, we recognize and respect the inherent sovereignty of the 12 First Nations. We are grateful to work alongside Indigenous tribes to fulfill our obligation to protect and preserve clean air and water for everyone. This work becomes even more crucial as we face the growing threat of climate change. The climate crisis is here and our future depends on solving it. That is why we are so excited about the work that young climate activists like Charles, Mario, and Madeline are doing. To introduce this event, Doug LaFollette, co-founder of, of our organization and namesake of these environmental speakers programs, would like to say a few words. Hello, everybody. It's great to be able to introduce this program on youth climate activism, which is so important, so critical to our future. You know, when I started Clean Wisconsin as Wisconsin Environmental Decade 50 years ago, I had two purposes. One was to affect legislation, to work in the capital to get better laws and stop bad ones, and to work with communities, with people all across Wisconsin that had problems with groundwater or air pollution or any problem they had, we could help them as Clean Wisconsin. And that's been so successful. I'm so proud of the organization that I started. Well, when I wrote the book, you know, the Survival Handbook, I mentioned climate change, although nobody was talking about it. And of course, now the climate issue, which I call climate disruption, has become critical to our future. And I've studied it very carefully. And I, I want to tell people we have a problem. We have to do something. And what's exciting to me is how young people all across Wisconsin and all across the world have begun to take up this issue because it's important to them and their future. And they understand it even better than some of the old fogies in the legislature, if I can say that, in Washington. So hello, everybody. It's great. I'm so excited about this panel discussion and so excited about the young people of Wisconsin who are taking up the environmental issue as a cause for them and our future. Thank you all. Thank you for that introduction, Doug. If you have questions throughout the panel, depending on if you are listening on Facebook Live or Zoom, please enter those questions in the comments section or chat. I will now turn the conversation over to our moderator, Maitha Lee Comfy. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you, Luke, for introducing us to this event today. My name is Maitha Lee Campy, and I'm the Climate Justice Organizer with Clean Wisconsin. A little bit about me before we begin, and then I'll pass the mic over to our wonderful panelists to also introduce themselves. Um, as the climate justice organizer at Clean Wisconsin, my role is to develop broad community support for climate solutions throughout the state. Clean Wisconsin recognizes that a healthy climate is something that we all have a stake in. And so we're committed to engaging community members and residents in this process of creating a more fair and just world through our climate solutions. And that's where I come in. Before joining Clean Wisconsin, I was a student at University of California, Santa Barbara, and I graduated in the spring of 2020, right in the middle of that pandemic. But while I was in college, I was involved with Sunrise Movement, which for those who don't know, is a youth led climate activism organization. I started a chapter for Sunrise Movement in my college at UC Santa Barbara, and I interned with Sunrise Movement in the summer of 2019 to help build their training program out nationally. 
I've also been involved in local climate work in the county of Santa Barbara, and I've worked with other organizations on the intersectionality of climate justice with other social justice issues for change. And I think youth are the perfect vehicles for talking about climate activism because ultimately we have a very pronounced stake in this fight. As young people, we are going to inherit this world and all that the climate, the climate crisis will bring with it. And so it's our responsibility to act and build a future we wish to see. And to speak more to that today, we have three wonderful climate activists from Wisconsin here to join us. And so I'll pass the mic over to Mario, then Charles, and then Madeline to introduce themselves. Go ahead, Mario. Uh, so my name is Mario Kanakasko. Um, uh, climate activist here in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and um, that's about it. Oh, and then I, I run a podcast called, called Youth Talk Climate. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Charles. Thanks, Wifley. Uh, my name is Charles. Um, I graduated from Madison West High School in 2018, born and raised in Madison, and I'm now currently serving on the board uh, of Clean Wisconsin and had um, the opportunity to continue different environmental work um, both in Wisconsin as well as now on the East Coast, um, attending college there. And go ahead, Madeline, could you introduce? Uh, yeah, my name is Madeline McDermott and I'm from Appleton, Wisconsin. I've done a lot of work with School Strike for Climate and now I'm currently on Appleton's Climate Change Task Force. Great, thank you all so much for being able to join us today and talk about the importance of young people getting involved with climate activism. Madeline, could you get us started by telling us why you chose to get involved in climate activism and what you hope to accomplish through this? Yeah, so climate activism has been a part of my life for a while now. Um, it's been about three years and I've always really cared about environmental issues, and there was an opportunity to get involved um, back when school strikes for climate were happening. Um, and I was really interested in that because I felt like I could do something about this issue that was so big and affecting so much of my life. Um, so I started showing up to protests and through that I met a lot of activists who were involved in this and other issues in my community. and. I found that I could actually, you know, impact my local government. So I just kept showing up to that. And, and I feel like I've made a lot of change and I can, can continue to make change um, through the Climate Change Task Force. So I'm really happy about that. That's great. Yeah, getting involved at the local level and making change from the ground up is one of the many ways that youth climate activists are making a change in their communities. Mario, could you also speak a little bit to what you, why you got involved and why you chose the medium that you did to talk about climate? Yeah, so I became involved because over time, um, as growing up and now, I tend I started realizing that like summers were getting hotter, springs were getting drier, and then there were more severe floodings throughout my area, um, and that really pushed me to start to investigate what climate change really is, um, and I really liked working. On, in radio, I had an internship in radio, so I thought uh, creating a you, uh, like a podcast that's centered on exploring all the different avenues of climate change would really help um, not only uh, youth but anyone sort of explore those avenues of climate change. Um, I think that a lot of people tend to wonder when is climate change going to happen, but fail to realize that it's happening now. That's a really great point. Yeah, we see the impacts of climate change around us today. And so Charles, relating to that, could you tell us how you got involved? Sure, yeah, I think it's a combination of um, a, a lot of different factors for me personally, but just growing up in Wisconsin, I think you're just so constantly surrounded by being outdoors and nature is very much part of the fabric of your, of your lifestyle and very much apparent in the education curriculum as well, just in terms of what you learn about in school and field trips that you take. And so I think that was what really cultivated a sense of uh, you know, just desire to better connect with nature for, from a young age for me. And it actually was reinforced by my second grade teacher who really emphasized two things in the classroom. One was um, the importance of just 
climate change, and this was back in 2008 before it was something that was sort of top of mind for a lot of folks, but I think him just emphasizing that as well as the importance of just taking initiative whenever we saw a problem in the classroom at sort of a small scale, but also just in the world broadly at a large scale, I think that was a very powerful message growing up. And specifically um, in high school, the, the, the project that I was working on was just um, uh, our school's environmental club raised $150,000 for solar panels for our school. And part of why that effort, I think, was really um, why we wanted to take the approach that we did was so that we could pull in all different kinds of stakeholders into the conversation, not just students or parents or teachers, um, but also, you know, alumni, the local business community, and just Madison residents more broadly. And that, to me, is pretty emblematic of just the problem as a whole. Like climate change, to me, is the ultimate problem. It's, it's uniquely different from almost any other social issue that we face because it has that sense of time and urgency, that dimension to it, that... Um, is, you know, specifically and, and especially the case for, for climate. And I, it's also so deeply interdisciplinary and holistic where it affects everyone and everyone affects it to a big degree. And I think that just goes to show just how much of a role we all have and how much responsibility we all have to at least take some action, whatever that ends up looking like to address the issue. Thank you. Yeah, let's stay on this topic of the intersectionality of climate change and how it connects to, as you said, so many other social issues and so many aspects of our lives. Um, Charles, could you speak a little bit to what climate justice looks like to you? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think definitely something that I um, uh, hadn't reflected on nearly as much as I, I would have liked until, especially I would say over this past year with the culmination of greater awareness around um, public health issues and how that's related to um, racial injustice and how that's related to, to climate change. Um, but I think kind of related to that point, I was first exposed to sort of the concept of environmental justice and, and climate justice. Um, probably this was my sophomore year of high school. And at the time, I remember just in the broader environmental movement, it was always seen as this separate um, sort of uh, um, issue area from sort of the core, you know, root root issues associated with climate change. Like how do we basically, you know, accelerate the deployment of renewable energy or how do we, um, you know, clean up the transportation sector? And while those are very much important issues, obviously, uh, environmental justice was always seen as this trade-off with climate action and as this sort of impediment or something that would slow down climate action. But I think especially this past year, it's been shown that that's just false. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of surveys and studies out there showing that communities of color uh, and, and low income communities and other historically underrepresented or, mar or marginalized groups, not only have they contributed the least to the problem in many instances, but they now suffer the most from the problem. And in addition to that, they're also some of the most engaged communities. Um, there are a lot of surveys out there showing that, for example, Latinx community is not only the most climate aware, um, just from a racial demographic standpoint, but also the most, you know, taking the most tangible actions right now to address the issue. And I think just um, climate justice is, is about seeing how different issues are interconnected. Uh, public health is not a separate issue from income inequality, which is not a separate issue from climate change. I think they're all related. And I think just, especially this past year, and hopefully that's um, continues to be the case where we make those connections between different issues that we face and see. Yeah, absolutely. And so how do you see the work that you did with um, your high school raising money for the solar initiative? How do you see that work sort of relating to uplifting the community you live in? Yeah, that's a it's a great question, in part, because I think there are so many opportunities in terms of how climate is related to education that I think just don't get talked about enough. And, and that makes sense in some sense, because, you know, we're just so focused on how do we clean up our electricity grid and, and our transportation sector? But I, just for, from a personal story, for me, there's, you know, I think that the vast majority of the reason why I'm so passionate about this issue today is because I had a second grade teacher that from a very young age planted a seed in my mind. And there are some classmates and friends that I had from that class that are now involved in uh, environmental issues across the state and, and, and beyond. And I don't think that's a coincidence in part because I think exposure at such a young age to seeing, wow, this is such a big issue, but why aren't we doing more about it? Um, just shows how important education is to just building awareness around climate action. And so that was part of why um, our environmental group at Madison West High School was really focused on this idea of bringing renewable energy to schools is because there's so many opportunities for overlap 
not only is that where you know the biggest uh, sort of growth in jobs is right now is in clean energy, but also just how much we can learn, not just in terms of hard skills around you know energy systems or things like that, but also soft skills in terms of how do you talk to people to fundraise, um, to raise money, or to build awareness around certain issues. So um, I, I think in that sense there are so many areas where climate is related to education that I think can uplift communities in, in a lot of ways. Absolutely. And Madeline, I know that you've also had a lot of experience looking at these intersections of climate justice with other social justice issues. And could you speak a little bit to how you see climate justice? Um, how do you, how do you, sorry, let me rephrase that. What does climate justice look like to you? Uh, yeah, so I think that um, one thing I'd like to talk about is how the systems of oppression that are creating the climate crisis are also systems of oppression um, that are keeping people of color oppressed. I think um, one thing that a lot of people don't actually know about, even though they may live in Wisconsin, is that we have two pipelines in Wisconsin. Uh, one of them is line three, which is a tar sands pipeline, which only goes through like a very small portion of northern Wisconsin. It goes from Minnesota and ends right around there. And then the other one is line five, um, which goes through northern Wisconsin um, to Michigan. And it actually passes under Lake Michigan right now. Um, they carry tar sands oil, which is very harmful to the environment. Um, and if this oil was actually to be used, a lot of climate scientists say that it would be like game over for the climate crisis because of how many emissions it would produce. Um, but other than that, these pipelines are also very harmful um, to indigenous people. Uh, line five used to go through the Bad River Reservation um, and it's about to be rerouted, but it still goes through their treaty territory. It's still, um, threatens their right to hunt, fish, and gather. And because these communities have been cut off from a lot of vital resources, um, many of these people still live off the land. You know, it's not only their traditional practices, but it's a matter of survival. Um, and the thing is, Native sovereignty and their liberation is collective liberation for us all, because even though these pipelines um, disproportionately affect these people, um, if we can stop this and other resource extraction, it'll be better for everyone in the long run. And we have to listen to these people in order to know um, how to live on this land in a way that won't harm it and in a way that can be good for everyone. You know, I can only speak um, as an Acadian person. I'm not from a native community, but I know that um, these things are very threatening um, to all people and these um, patriarchal colonial systems impact everyone. Um, there's a connection between missing and murdered indigenous women and resource extraction. So it's a very real threat um, to native women and two spirits and native people in general because there's more violence when pipelines and other resource extraction happen. And I think there's a lot of overlap between these issues, but because of how much erasure there is of Native people, we don't always talk about um, pipelines and resource extraction when we talk about the climate crisis. You know, people focus on individual actions when we have um, very real threats to our environment, to people, um, to the climate happening in our state right now. So that's just one thing I'd like to say. Yeah, thank you for giving voice to the crucial connection between indigenous sovereignty and climate justice. It's clearly inextricable. And uh, I really like the point that you brought up about collective liberation. And so could you tell us a little bit about how your work on the Appleton uh, County Task Force on Climate Change kind of connects to these ideas of collective liberation and uplifting your community in Appleton? Yeah, so. Appleton, um, a lot of people view it as a more progressive community in central Wisconsin. Um, and that is somewhat true, but it also used to be a sundown town and then unfortunately has a very long history of racism. Um, 
Today through redlining, a lot of Appleton is still essentially segregated. Um, and in downtown Appleton, we have basically a food desert, you know, there's no grocery stores um, in that part of Appleton. Um, and of course, like people talk about um, solar energy, green energy and all of that. But if you're a renter, you know, you don't get to decide where your energy comes from. You don't get to decide like, if you have loud service lines or if you have like other sources for your water, you know, like you don't have that right. And a lot of times you don't even have the right to grow your own food that's been taken away from you. So I think that we're definitely still working on it because the climate change task force isn't as geared towards racial equity as it should be. Um, I can definitely say that, but you know, we have a lot of problems with racism, with systemic racism in Appleton, and that's something that needs to be addressed to solve the climate crisis. Um, you know, because these issues that affect um, low income people uh, and people of color, you know, those are the people that are bearing the brunt of the climate crisis. Um, it's going to affect them first and it's affecting them now. Um, and also, you know, a lot of these solutions for climate change, you know, they aren't always as um, accessible to people that are low income. And that's something that you need to keep in mind, you know. Um, it's like you can't always have, you know, you can't decide to have solar or wind power when you're not the person who controls where you get your energy from. And also, if you look at energy efficiency, there's a lot of ways that clean energy can actually be more equitable. Um, if you have a building that's more energy efficient, it'll be less of an energy bill for that person personally. And I think that, um, you know, climate change is urgent, but it's not more urgent than the crisis of racial injustice in this country. Um, and there really isn't one way to solve one without the other um, because white supremacy is harmful to the environment and it's harmful to people. Um, and, you know, people are the environment. We're not separate from it. We've just been told that we're separate from it. Um, and I, yeah, I really don't think there's a way to address one without the other. Um, and that goes for this whole country, but it goes for my community too. Thank you, Madeline. Mario, I, I know I've, well, I've listened to your podcast and I know you also have an episode about racial equality and how it connects to climate justice. And so could you also tell us a little bit about what climate justice looks like to you? Yeah, so from the pieces that my, my amazing team and, team and I have done on climate justice, I think that climate justice looks a lot like companies being held accountable and communities being given the aid that they that they need. Many of impoverished communities are held, uh, are placed right by highways or industrial zones, and these communities bolster a lot of impoverished people as well as a lot of minorities. Um, and these people are through these industrial zones are now given generational health problems, such as asthma, and other problems and as well as their soil is being polluted so they can't like they can't harvest they can't have gardens where they live um, so you have essentially like a huge part of their livelihood has just been cut off by government and like corporate greed so i think my work helps uh share like those perspectives from all around the world because climate change is not just an american problem it's it's a whole world problem so i think once you you're i think once listeners are able to hear about this problem through a human, it really humanizes that, that problem and it makes it sort of something you can't ignore. Thank you. And could you speak a little bit more to um, these intersections that you've noticed between environmental activism and the fight for other civil and social rights? Yeah, so for me, it's it's everywhere. You know, I think these problems at their core are all interconnected. So like uh, Madeline said, you cannot solve one without solving the other. Um, so my, my work involves my team and I looking at various issues and learning about said issues that we might have like never thought about. So like when we ask about pollution and climate disasters, we continually see, continuously see that the most effective communities are impoverished minority communities. And yeah, so yeah. Um, so like if you take, for example, um, like Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Katrina was decades ago, right? But the impact is still there. So a lot of those people that were affected, uh, a lot of that big community was African American. So they were just displaced from their home. They were giving that government aid. So I think that's just one example of those intersectionalities. And there's many more. So 
even now as we start seeing like more climate events, we really need to start focusing on like the communities of those those climate effects, those climate um, like, oh man, I lost the word. Uh, that those climate yeah those climate disasters are affecting, um, and you'll see that it's just the same communities over and over again. Um, but that's just one small piece of intersectionality. It's it's a bigger picture. Absolutely, and I completely agree. I think learning about the disproportionate impacts of Hurricane Katrina on Black Americans versus more upper class and middle class white Americans was personally an, an awakening point for me to understand that the climate crisis will also be dealt with in that unequal manner. Madeline, could you also give our readers um, an example to help them to help re our, sorry, our listeners understand um, how racial inequality really manifests itself through climate disasters. Madeline. Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry, it's okay. Um, yeah, I think, um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, communities of color have had a lot of um, security taken away from them and they've been displaced, you know, through gentrification, um, even with native communities, you know, through allotment and through reservations, um, a lot of people have been displaced and put in areas where they're closer um, to industrial plants or they're closer to places that will be more affected by disasters. And there's also um, less preparedness for when disasters happen. Um, one thing that the Climate Change Task Force talks about a lot is mitigation and things that can be done for that. Um, but a lot of times, unfortunately, these communities are left behind. You know, people don't talk about how they're going to respond to flooding or how they respond to heat waves or what will happen um, with climate migration. You know, again, this is a global issue. Um, and a lot of people in the global south are getting displaced by climate change. Um, and, you know, one infrastructure thing that we don't talk about is, you know, how is this country going to treat people um, when they're fleeing heat waves and natural disasters um, and they're coming here because there's going to be a lot of movement happening because of the climate crisis. Um, and I think, you know, just where people live um, has such a big impact on their life, you know, because of redlining um, and because of gentrification. Um, so, of course, you know, if you if neighborhoods are so different from each other, if where you live, where you go to work, where you go to school is completely different for different people, um, you know, it's gonna impact those people differently when crises happen because um, it's not that the people aren't prepared, it's just that a lot of that, a lot of those resources that could help them be prepared has been taken away from them and isn't it isn't being addressed when it comes to the climate crisis. Definitely. Thank you all so much for speaking to this and helping our listeners really understand this, this connection of how all of these issues are inextricably tied together and how addressing one means we need to address all of them without separating them into different camps or different movements, but rather understanding that the climate movement is a movement for a more fair and just future for all of us. So. Before we pass it back to Luke to bring our listener questions in, I'd like to take a moment to ask you all about your goals or projects for 2021 and how our listeners today can assist you or other youth in achieving these goals. So first I'll pass the mic to Charles. Could you speak a little bit to what you're, what you're up to this year? Sure, yeah, a lot of different things going on, but I think um, sort of connected to what I mentioned earlier, just in terms of some of the solar on schools work that I'd previously done, we're ultimately hoping to build that out sort of at a statewide and hopefully regional and then maybe even national level. There's a big sort of push for integrating some of the ways in which energy and education are related, especially under the new Biden administration. We see that with their commitment to, you know, funding, for example, electric school buses for many school districts um, and just making some of those connections more salient. So uh, basically, if anybody knows any um, uh, particularly passionate um, students across the state, um, we'd love to continue to build out that network um, of uh, 
students and, and just advocates um, working to advance solar in schools. That's great. Very exciting to hear. Madeline, how about you? What are you up to in this year and how can our listeners support you? Yeah, so um, I'm definitely going to say stop line three, stop line five. Um, yeah, there's resource extraction in our state. And I feel like if you're listening um, and you're from like more southern Wisconsin or even just a more urban area, I'd encourage you to talk about it. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of people that are even like involved in the climate movement, but they don't know that this is happening. Um, and there's definitely a lot more resources online. I wouldn't say that I'm the best person um, to talk about this, but uh, with line five an environmental review um, was just ordered by President Biden. So that isn't being constructed right now. There's a bit more time. Um, but unfortunately, all of the permits have gone through for line three um, and there is construction on that pipeline right now. Um, there are people on the front lines right now um, in um, Minnesota. I know a couple of my friends from this area who are camping out there right now um, because it's a very pressing, pressing issue. And I'd encourage you um, to support those people or even if you have the means to go and join them um, because they need more people on the front lines to stop that pipeline. Because again, it's, you know, it's over for the climate crisis if that tar sands is extracted. Um, it'll create like so many emissions and it's so harmful to so many people that live there. Um, yeah, as for more locally, uh, right now I'm working on a campaign to get Appleton, um, all of their municipal buildings to 100% uh, renewable energy by 2040. And then for all of our um, residences and commercial buildings to have 75% clean energy by 2040. Um, so if anyone lives in the Appleton area or the Fox Valley, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love your help with that um, for local action and also action you know, in our state and beyond. So uh, I also, I really appreciate you bringing me onto this panel. Um, it's been a good time, thank you. Thank you, Madeline. And definitely the action begins with every individual. And so Madeline's given some great opportunities for individuals to harness their own power and use their agency to create change around them. So thank you. And Mario, could you tell us a little bit about what your goals are for this year? Yeah, so um, my team and I really wanna make like our podcast more inclusive. So we're looking at making episodes um, in other languages. Um, myself as like a Spanish speaker, I would really like to have Spanish speaking uh, climate activists come on the show, um, which by the way, is uh, Youth Talk Climate. And you can also find us on Instagram at Youth Talk Climate, by the way. Um, but yeah, I want them to come in and share this per uh, perspectives because to me, perspectives mean a lot. Um, everyone has their own individual perspective and all of these individual uh, social problems that they follow. And a lot of these social problems are all interconnected. We might not realize it, um, but you can't solve one without the others, you know? Um, and I think, you know, you guys and the people listening on to here can all just help by, you know, listening to the podcast, sharing it. Uh, but you can also help by just continuing your climate education. You know, the more you become informed on all these social problems, the more, the better you become, you know, you, you're keeping your mind open and you're sort of learning more about all these social issues. Um, so that, that's a big part of it too, you know, just expanding your education, um, keeping an open mind and just taking care of yourself and taking care of others. I think, um, we all tend to bubble ourselves in sometimes. And, you know, especially with climate change, we all tend to think that it's not gonna affect us, but it's been affecting us for decades, uh, millenniums. Um, so yeah, you know, that, that's, pretty much, that's pretty much it. Absolutely. And Mario, your podcast brings up the great point that a lot of climate education, the, the kind that really sticks are personal stories. People really relate to stories. People see themselves in stories and so, all of our listeners today, we highly encourage you to check out Mario's podcast. Again, that's Youth Talk Climate. And now we're going to turn it back to Luke to bring up any questions that our listeners might have had for us today. I'm not seeing anything come through. So thank you so much, guys. This was, this was great. Um, it's really wonderful to hear about what all you guys are doing. And it's so inspiring that at, at young ages, you guys are getting really involved and really delving into this existential problem. 
Um, so thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about it. If nobody has any questions, I think we can sign off. Thank you, Thanks. by the way. Thank you all so much. It was great speaking with you today.